Um, well, welcome back. Now we have a, uh, a very, very interesting case. Um, it's kind of at the opposite end of the value chain and probably in a different category. Now we're going to be looking at somebody on the supply side that is coming into the marketplace, has established the supply chain, and now you're trying to figure out how this um, small, small um, operation, uh, small operation of a larger business, of course, but a small operation off the coast of, uh, of South Africa is going to get their product out to the world. Uh, it's a little closer home to the people in the room. Uh, it's a little closer home in the ingredient space. Uh, but I think there's a tremendous amount that we can talk about and learn, and I hope everybody's comfortable um, and has as much candor and openness as they did in the first case to talk about it. Okay? Um, I want to... Does this... Can I get to the next slide? Perfect. All right, this is how I'm going to start it off. Um, this is a nice old world map. And as you uh, can see, uh, Africa on the right-hand side, down in the, the bottom south part there, there's a little island. And that's where our case takes place. Uh, imagine you're in Coogan's shoes. He's established his supply chain. He's ready to go to the market. He's got huge pressure. He's got the supply chain going. He has to sell oil. He has to move it. He has to enter this market. He has to go talk to a whole bunch of people. Um, on the human side, which is distinctly different than the animal side, I think everybody can, can, can agree with that. So he's got to buy an airplane ticket. Where does he go? He's got to get on the train. He's got to get on a plane somewhere. Where does he go? Does he, does he jump to Asia? Does he jump to Europe? Does he jump to North America? Does he stay local? Where does he go the first step? Anybody? Tell me more. So what, what's the criteria for where, deciding where he's going to go? I think that uh, there are a number of possibilities, obviously, the size of the market, for example. But if we, you want to go quickly to a place, you need to go to a place where you can actually sell the product. So you can enter the product into China. For example, you cannot bring krill oil into China. So even if I wanted to, well, tough for me. Um, so you need to, the market to allow you to sell the product, you need the regulatory uh, landscape to allow you to sell the product and to say whatever you want to say. Uh, other than that, if the marketing allows it, well, good luck. Okay. Anybody else? Where would he go? Where would you tell Coogan to, to buy the ticket? Anybody? There you go. I think you have to consider your logistic limitations. Since you are in a remote area, you have to see where you have advantages because your product will have value on delivery basis, not on FOB basis. Okay. Somebody else? Tom, I think um, you become a member of GoEd and you go to the next GoEd exchange. Well, there you go. Uh, and you become a member of EFO. You know, the International Fish Meal Fish Oil guys, and you go to that conference as well. All right. What else? I mean, he's got oil now. He's got, he's got inventory. He's going to sell it. Where does he go? So if we look at the tuna oil, uh, I think it's special by being high in DHA. So you probably want to uh, look at the industry that, that where it's probably going to have most value and end up, which, as far as I understand it, the infant formula. Okay. So you might want to start visiting some of those companies, even though you may not be able to sell to them directly. You want to understand what their requirements are. Okay. And then see what is your own technology. How far can you take it yourself? How much can you do of refining compared to what is the customer requirements? And then you want to look at the supply chain. Can you sell directly or do you need to sell to somebody who can do the last step before it goes there? So how is your, what's your uh, path to market or what do you call it, a way to market? Okay. Uh, I think that was would be how I would approach it. And then there may be something about certifications uh, that would be required. Uh, so you would see if there are accreditations that they already have, if they're meeting the, the market requirements. Okay. And then it seems that the market for infant formula is in Asia. So from that perspective, geogra geographically, they're not that badly positioned. So I think, it, I think that's where I would be looking in that direction. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? 
Yes, Mark. Right up front here. I mean, yes, I, I do agree. Huh? You have to go where the value is. But the problem uh, maybe is about capacity and capabilities of bringing the product to the market. So, uh, yeah, I mean, um, I think I, I just reviewing the case, um, does Coogan have the capacity to really uh, create value by himself by uh, building a new process or, and then after that, does he have the capacity to, uh, to bring to the market in China the infant uh, formula, yes but it's a very small market, extremely um, uh, specific and very hard to reach. So there are some questions um, about, do you go alone? Do you go with someone? Do you partner with someone okay. to do so? So yes, those maybe are the issues that need to be uh, raised. So yeah. you said small market, do you mean number of customers or size of the market or volume? Size or? of the market and uh, I don't know too much about the oil, but uh, it seems to me that there are two types of oil, you know, the very high hand where he's trying to push it, which is a market which is quite expensive. And to my understanding and my knowledge, there's only a very few people on the side of the planet who can actually pay these prices. So after that, there is another part of the, of the fish oil, of the tuna oil that can be marketed. So how do you bring this other part that you have to create better value, maybe in the pet food, but you still need some refining capacities. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Somebody else? Who are um, likely customers for Coogan? I heard somebody talk about infant formula, traveling to where those are. Uh, can, he, can you approach an infant formula company right now? Can he do that? Would that be productive? Who would he sell to? Who, who, who's going to be looking for his oil? Anybody? Yeah. Refiners. We're based down in New Zealand, and we are certainly looking for tuna oil to refine. So he should probably go. come and talk See? to us. There you go. Customer right there. So it's somebody else. Who, who's the customer? Who's Coogan's customer? Anybody? Can he take his oil, put it in a drum? Ship it to me, Johnson, and they use it? Does it work like that? Anybody? Well, uh, it, it depends uh, if uh, they need a refining or, and depending on what's in that oil, the quality, to comply okay. with uh, regulation that we were talking before. We, we need to know the composition, what pollutants, uh, what uh, non-regulated compounds are, are they generating, if they are many things to take into account to go to infant formula. Okay. Very good. Anybody else? And the customers. Anybody have any idea how many customers there are? If, if he's going to sell to a refiner, how many refiners are there in the globe in fish oil? Anybody have an idea? Roughly? Somebody take a guess. 100. 100. Pretty good number. Anybody have a different number? Mark? I think less than 100, huh? definitely. And I think you can't count them maybe on one hand or two. A processing tuna is not an easy job. Huh? OK. So you're talking about refining tuna oil. And I think somebody might have been talking about overall refiners, right? Yeah. Because I think it's somewhere around 110 globally, give or take a couple. Some seem to come in the market every day. Some kind of, you know, try to go out. But, but you've got a very relatively small number of customers that are focusing on tuna, correct? Yeah, correct. Okay. Any, do you think that the market for Coogan is in the, the crude or semi-refined market? Should they be doing refined oil? Should they skip right to it? Anybody? Is that hard to do? do you, is, it, is it hard? There must be people in the room that have gone from um, just dealing with the crude oil and all of a sudden said, hey, we're going to start doing some refining, which is several steps. Yeah, they can refine the tuna oil, but as Mark said, it's really difficult to refine the tuna oil. You have to process it several times, of course, depending on the quality. Um, then, um, if they want to refine it themselves, uh, they have to build a refinery. And the cost of a refinery is huge. Hmm. So, 
to build a refinery just for a few hundred tons of tuna oil, uh, the payback uh, may take a century. Hmm. Okay, so at, at the kind of volume we're talking about that they're pulling in, if I paraphrase it, I know it's, it's a very slow turnaround because, or payback, because you can only do slow volume and it's a big investment. Yes? I, I think there's also a question of where you want to be on the value chain. Yep. You know, how much of the ingredient or even, you know, if one wants to kind of break through the B2B to the B2C barrier, you could be completely vertically integrated theoretically from fishing through capsules or functional food products you know, on the shelf. Yep. And you know, that's then a question of where you want to be on the value chain and then the you know, capital requirements to be there. Um, and or investments. You know, if one wanted to be a branded ingredient, then there's a whole question around um, IP, clinical trials, regulatory approvals, et cetera, et cetera. But again, you're capturing more of the value chain. Okay. So what, what, what do you think as a group? What is it that sounds special about Coogan's operation? What's special about it? What's something that you could leverage as differentiation? I think that um, you should look at um, sustainability issues for this oil and yes. see if that is something that may be different in his location than it may be in other locations. I think, you know, the, you have a number of, of tuna oil um, extraction facilities around the world. Um, at the end of the day, you need the infant formula market, which I think is the only one that really can take volume of refined oil. And entering that market, you need all the accreditations and um, experience as a refiner. So I think the oil has to go into uh, to other customers for refining. Um, and in order to differentiate from the other producers, I think um, you need to, or you should be able to tell a story or bring an added benefit that other sources may not have. Okay, excellent. Anybody else? I'd echo uh, Oliver's point about sustainability, but also uh, specifically with tuna, um, is there opportunities to differentiate based on fair, fair labor? And there's a lot of okay. uh, human slavery issues associated with tuna, um, especially in the US, um, in the natural market, which is kind of the incubation for, for supplements. Um, people really, really care about fair labor. So, yeah, excellent. Is, is point. there something Mauritius yep. has that, you know, other tuna sure. producers do, don't? Yeah, I mean, it's a huge issue. I guess you could elaborate on the coffee industry and fair trade around coffee is huge and things like that. Anybody else? There we go. Yep. I think uh, tuna oil obviously has a unique fatty acid uh, profile and, and ratio that uh, really uh, is, a, is a niche play into the infant formula, toddler formula market. Um, so if I was Coogan, I'd be looking at uh, selling his crude oil to uh, an established refiner that already has that established supply chain into, into infant formula. Okay. Let me ask, is it, is it easy to find tuna, crude tuna oil? Is, that, is it plentiful? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Tom. Christian here. Hey, Christian. I just want to comment a little bit because I uh, have uh, found out about this Madagascar tuna fishery. Tuna is considered such an overexploited species that many sushi restaurants don't even carry it anymore. But these guys, they have a sustainable fishery. They have a wonderful story to tell, and I think they should aim at natural and unique and sustainability. They have a fantastic story to tell, so go ahead. Thank you. Is anybody afraid of the tuna story? Yeah. Tell me. Come on, let's hear about it. I'm confused. I thought the whole, I thought DHA was all algae. I didn't even realize it came from tuna. Oh, I don't know that much about it, to be honest with you, which is part of the reason I'm afraid of it. I mean, it's a lot like a salmon story where there's different species and there's different pressures, and so being able to wade through the, the morass of information that's out there. So one way he may be able to, to make a point of differentiation is to be actual a source and authority uh, for that type of information. So he can actually provide a service to his prospective customers by helping them straighten out those ambiguities. Okay, thank you. Somebody else? Anybody else afraid of tuna? Does that story? I mean, there are people in the room. I know I've been to your website. You have tuna-free DHA oil, right? There's got to be a reason. 
Is that big? Uh, yes, I, I, I would be afraid of, of a little story because uh, even if you put a, a good story or even a good source or even a really good quality, uh, there's, there's a, a, a price gap that, that you can assume and other that you can't assume. And many industries are concerned about that. There are replacers, gaming, I mean, there are other sources of high DHA content that we can and probably will replace part or all the actual market for the tuna oils, that, that could happen. So it's, it's the same story with organics. Uh, uh, there's a good story about organics. Many people is in love with organics, but how much in love you need to be for paying the, the, the premium gap. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Yes. Well, it would seem to me um, that there is an opportunity to incorporate some of the ideas that were talked about yesterday in the uh, labeling and consumer insights discussion. I mean, Mauritius is a unique place, beautiful part of the world. Um, it seems to me like some of the imagery that they were talking about using on labels could certainly be used in this guise. And to make that statement or that differentiation from some of the things that have been said about tuna, that it's unclean for a number of reasons, you know, labor issues, contamination issues, possible adulteration because it's coming from sources where maybe you're not always sure if it's all tuna or if it's something else. Okay, thank you. Somebody else? And show of hands, how many people really like the tuna story? Does it make you comfortable? Is it something you can build on? We know Christian likes it. Gretchen? Somebody else? Yeah, tell me. All right. Thanks, Oliver. Um, how about somebody that really doesn't like it? Somebody that's really worried about it? I mean... Hey, Paul. Hello. <laughs> hey, Tom. Um, you know, just going to, like, Monterey Bay Aquarium events a lot of times, tuna is a definite red flag to people who have that sort of uncomfortable amount of environmental knowledge where they're quick enough to make a judgment but not deep enough to go deeply into the issue. So I think for the green consumer, tuna reads two things, um, overfished, which bluefin, even though this has nothing to do with bluefin, overfished and, and mercury okay. are those two flags that immediately come up. And uh, I don't know how that translates to this market, but from an environmental point of view, it would be hard to get past that, I think. Okay. I'd like to make a comment on that. I think. Um, what really would be important is um, differentiate between the tuna species and um, you have like, there are different like this, uh, what is it called, this red, um, no, what is it, red list that gives a, a certain eco rating for all the different fish species. And then, you know, you got like six or seven or eight different tuna species and one is almost extinct and the other one has the best category in that eco rating and the best category you could get there is least concerned. Mm. Um, but you can't get, it, get better than that. And so actually the, the tuna that is used in um, the infant formula and in the DHA oil production, it's not the sushi tuna, it's not the big species, it's the, the, the skipjack, the, the tiny species, which is not endangered. So ecologically, there is no, no real issue. I mean, tuna sounds like, because you read a lot about tuna being exploited, but it's particular species which are not used in that DHL oil production. And then contaminants, of course, these big tuna, they accumulate a lot of contaminants, and even the smaller one do, but, you know, once it's refined, you, are, you don't find any contaminants in there. So um, I think the, um, the tuna, DHA oil, has an image problem that needs to be addressed. I mean, I don't know if that would be your job, but um, you could be one promoting that. Okay. Thank you very much. Somebody else? Yeah. I think we need to uh, remember that tuna oil is a, it's a recovered byproduct. So the primary processing is, is the meat, either going into a, a can or a, or a pouch. So unlike anchovy fishing, where, where the, the fish are, are caught for the oil, Hmm. Uh, tuna oil is a, is a true value-added uh, byproduct. Okay. So you're really just using a waste stream instead of throwing it away. You're actually making some use out of it. Yeah? Yes. I, I really feel for this case here. Uh, the company is abbreviated MVP, and I'm also working for MVP Group. It's not the same company. Yeah. Our, our case, MVP stands for Modern Byproducts, and I've been looking at some of these sustainability schemes in terms of, of our products. And there is actually, uh, in the ASC scheme, there is a specific 
sort of is really nice and easy to do if you come have oils that come from from trimmings, which is the case in this case. So, from a sustainability point of view, I think it's a really good case here, uh, and that's what they should be worrying about if they want to sell in a in a business to business, and I guess into the infant formula. Whereas if they wanted to sell it into the business to consumer as a as a EPA DHA oil, I think they would be much more worried about, should be much more worried about this tuna thing and this potential crisis that they could have if there is a, if there is a, a bad story about tuna and, and, and some red list uh, tunas which could easily rub off on a, on a tuna uh, EPA DHA. Okay. Whereas if you're, if you're selling into uh, Nestle uh, as an ingredient, they would be much more looking at, you know, if, they, if they're certified, sustainable and they're technically meeting the requirements it's it's it's, it's much less uh, volatile i think okay thank you Excellent. yeah i mean i basically echo the same thing uh, i think if the story is as great as it sounds you be proactive you approach those entities you you acquire sustainability certification so that you can actually use that to your benefit i think you still have a challenge you may be able to make that work on a business to business level but on the business to consumer, it's going to be more challenging because the consumer is going to be more uh, uh, hesitant to get that deep into the story. But I think you can certainly make that work, but you have to take the, the bull by the horns, as it were, be proactive and work to get that uh, accomplished so you can really make that point of difference and make a strong case for that so you can come out as the green tuna or as, as we're not like every other tuna or what have you, you know, really make the case for it strongly. Okay. Excellent. Yago. Yeah, well, in, in this case, uh, sustainability uh, will, will make the difference for sure in, in, in infant formula sector. But on the other hand, and, and I'm seeing there, uh, refined uh, tuna oil itself, it, it, it has some contaminants left. Mm. It depends the technique uh, you are using. Uh, we, we saw in the morning with short path uh, distillation what you can remove, but it's not only what it's in the fish, it's what you are generating in refining process. And it's not regulated yet, but it will be. Infant formula producers are asking for new micro contaminants that you cannot control uh, with a, ref a normal refining process or a short path distillation. So we will have a new challenge controlling okay. uh, formation of new contaminants in the process. Uh, Iago, let me ask you a question. I, I would assume, with your technology and all your experience, that you are very particular about the tuna oil you buy. You, have, you must have some special s specification, which you don't need to share, but, I mean, you just don't buy any tuna oil. Is that correct? You, you that, that's It has to be tested a certain way, and it has to measure up a certain way, right? Completely correct, and, and it's, it's quite difficult to find the proper tuna oil in order to comply with, with uh, big uh, and, and relevant uh, infant formula uh, producers. Okay. So in the case, there was some information about EFSA actually increasing recommendations for DHA for infant formula. Um, Tell me a, your perspective on that. Is it something that's going to be leveraged for this case? What would, how would somebody like Coogan use that information? What would it do? Would it, would it boost his uh, optimism and his eagerness to go out in the market and talk to customers? Is it something he needs to pull back for a little bit? Would it change how he's, his strategy and what he focuses on? Anybody have a feel for that? Yes. I mean, that certainly is, is a great story and uh, great news for him. So um, if that is going to be um, actually adopted in the EU and set, um, then I would expect other geographies to follow. So, and I mean, even if the European infant formula DHA demand is doubled, um, that is a significant number. Do you know, uh, do, we, do we have experts on infant formula in the, in the room? Just curious. Do you know, how many infant formula manufacturers are there in Europe, roughly? Anybody know? Anybody else? 10, thanks. How many? How many in Europe? Any idea? No, not quite that much, but anybody else? I might be wrong. We did a project on, we there, looked, it was right around 25. Throughout Europe, about 25. Private label people, 
cooler manufacturers, things like that. How about in the U.S.? Anybody have an so, idea how many there are in the U.S.? So in the U.S., uh, there's Mead Johnson, there's Abbott. Uh, Wyeth left the U.S. market, but they still ma they make a lot of the generics. Yep. I know there are some companies trying to get into that market. Uh, I can't share who they are, but uh, they're in the already in the food space for children. But they're really we don't have a lot of producers, and and one of the one of the problems with the infant formula is that this is going down, and it's going to go down further. And and the infant formula companies that are out there right now are in trouble, like Mead Johnson's. When you say going down, could you clarify? What does that I mean, mean? the the market is decreasing okay. because because we have. I'm going to be politically incorrect here. Uh, we have uh, now women must see a social worker if they're not going to breastfeed their baby in the hospital. Hmm. At least in our hospital, it's gone almost insane. I mean, So the really, push is breastfeeding first, yeah? Right. They yeah. push breastfeeding to the, the baby friendly hospital has moved this into the, a very strange place for, hmm. for women. Now, once they go home, they, what we find is they're feeding about 50% human milk and 50% formula. So they'll continue to be a market for it, but it's, you know, I, I don't know, it's not like China. In, okay. Yeah, it's not like China where, where women are having to use formula and use it after the first year of life. I mean, there's, there's a big space. I think if, if I were going to get into this, I wouldn't get into infant formula. I'd get into the toddler market. Okay. Because they can't, they can't chew a capsule. Parents want them to get omega-3s that are buying into this. We don't have any evidence, really, that they need it. But again, coming back to Steve's remark about insurance, right? Uh, we we have guidance on food that children should eat a couple servings of fish a week, just like their parents. And right. we know parents aren't doing it, and children aren't doing it. So uh, people who are insecure about that would probably be looking for a beverage for a toddler that has omega threes. Uh, I, I think one of the issues here is also to make sure you get enough in the product that it makes sense because what, what I find out there is not significant in terms of amount. The child has to drink so much milk. They really should be able to get their serving in two glasses of milk a day or dairy product or yogurt or something okay. like that. So that's just my two cents. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, just to clarify, I believe in the U.S. there are only about five or six companies that actually produce infant formula. There's less that market it, but there are a few who produce it on a contract basis, but it's only a few. Um, so the quick question is, are there any infant formulas approved in the U.S. that use tuna oil? Does anybody know? Anybody know? There actually is one. There is one. And you know why? Do you know the key difference in the U.S.? Just as a point of, it's over the age of, over the age of 12 months or one, one year of age. Then, then it becomes a different category, I guess, if you know. So, excuse me? It's not infant formula. Well, Horizon Organics has a product that yeah. is in the formula range. So, um, okay. Um, so, uh, question. So, yes. the discussion of infant formulas just tangentially raises the question of senior formulas. And things like Insure are terribly out of balance and are missing omega-3s, and it's like the senior elder community is being told frequently to shift over to this formula, and it will get you through your life in a great way. But the attention to the omega-3 content of that is almost nil. And uh, as Dr. Carlson upgraded from infant formula to toddler formula, I just had to add that there's a vacuum on elder formulas and millions of Americans are consuming these things like Insure and we don't have a big push to get that omega-3 in and it ought to be there because they have the chronic diseases and in fact the omega-3s are probably easily marketed as a thing to delay aging as one of the previous speakers pointed out it is from 60 to 90 that there's this quality of life that is ruined by, by inadequate omega-3. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, final point, running down on time. Um, so based off of what you've heard, you have uh, 
supply locked up. It's difficult to get supply. They have a, a story, a sound story on sustainability. Um, their, their, two, their oil needs to be sold to somebody who can further refine it. Um, end markets might be infant formula or other markets like that. What do you think about their source, their, their contracting strategy with customers? What's the key element that would go forward? If you only, if you have something that's valuable and you only have a few different customers, how do you approach them? How do you go out to them? Anybody have any ideas or input on that? Let me add an extra piece. If you only have 200 to 400 metric tons available for capacity, so you have a limited amount of capacity, but you've got a nice story and a nice product, and you only have a few different customers, are you going to go out and sell it differently than if you have a very, very large volume with many, many customers? Is it different? Sure. Anybody? Well, in that case, um, in the case of a very small uh, supply and everything, that in the case of Coogan, uh, maybe a, a frame contract would be the best alternative for him because otherwise uh, it's already a hard product to sell and to market. So better have just one partner, a solid partner, to be able to uh, run that operation with you. In total collaboration, transparency. Okay. And that's the key, I think. Thanks, Mark. So if I paraphrase, it sounds like, okay, oh, Adam, last comment. I, I was just going to agree with Mark. I think there's lots of examples from other industries where you see that happen. Uh, you know, certainly in the cosmetic industry, there, there are lots of companies that have sustainable supply chains that create a lot of extra value for the ingredients that they provide, but they partner with an end product company that wants to tell that story that has those values core to its company. Um, and, and I think that that's a big opportunity here. And I, I, don't, I frankly, I don't see that in the infant formula space. I would argue that some of the other areas of the nutrition market are where you can see those types of partnerships work. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, in closing, real quick, um, I think this is an amazing story. I, I really would love to be in Coogan's shoes. He's got a, a tremendous challenge. He's got the supply chain set up, but he has the golden ticket, and that's access to fish. And he has the story behind it. It's a wonderful story. It has to be told the right way, and you have to make sure you're addressing a bunch of things. But he has that, and he has a small customer base he's targeting. So he, when he buys his first plane ticket, he doesn't have to fly all over the world. He's just got to go partner, like they said, a strategic alliance with a couple different customers, and then grow the business together. So he has to step out of the, out of the, the sort of the, the auction type sale and go and build a relationship with these companies, and he's going to have a long-term relationship. So I think it's a wonderful story. So thank you very much. With that, we'll bring Coogan up. Thanks for all your participation. It was really great. Appreciate your candor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, folks. I don't know if you should say good afternoon or good evening. A thanks, uh, Thomas, for the moderation. A I think uh, I forget. Thomas forget to tell is the reason he didn't pinpoint to the country on the map is the country is not on the map. Yeah. So thanks to you all for your input for that very, very small country and small company. I just want to emphasize in the introduction about uh, the story. I think uh, it was a thought process which started some times back and uh, the industry has come to turning point a couple of times in Mauritius, the tuna industry. 20 years back, like I've seen in videos on the first day, the oil used to go in boilers. And meals, I would say dodgy meals. No one's here who was working at that time. So no one take me to task. And I think 20 years back, that's what it was. Eight years back, technology was set up and uh, production took another turning point. Add value, bring in what the best you can. But good enough is not good enough. Eight years is not today. And again, the industry is at a crossroad. And the thought process started is, do we do what we know best, or do we do something new? It's an element of time, it's an element of cost, it's an element of resources. But the thought process, I mean, when I look at all the input, thank you very much, it proves some, somehow the thought process was not too stupid for Mauritius. Many, many relevant ideas came at that uh, time we started talking. But there's a good story to tell. I'm not marketing the, the product now. But there's a good story to tell because from we are at the 
beginning of the supply chain, the easiest but the costliest is to secure the logistics. Partner with fishing vessels, a cold storage facilities, transportation facilities. Make sure that your partners who are fishing respect a, the rules and regulations. And make sure that all fruit you are able to produce to get the best of what the resources is. No wonder resources, I mean, that's uh, an ongoing story. I think there would be less and less in the future. We are very conscious of that. And the thought process told us that we should do more with less, but do we do different things or do we do things differently? So in that thought process, I think a couple of years back, we started talking about all the elements which came up today. And the logistics are there today. We've got fishing, we've got uh, vessels transferring fish. We've got uh, a, the, the, the tuna factories running, the, the pouch lines running, and the business is built on co-products. So in a way, it adds value, and it's a sustainable business, because you're adding value, and what would have otherwise gone elsewhere is being used, is being a, reused to its best. So that's the, thing, the thought process. Also in the thought process is there's a good story to tell. We are a founder member of the IOTC, who regulates in a way, I mean, it's not as a well-known as other regulate, regulatory bodies, but the IOTC, Mauritius is a founder member which regulates tuna uh, practices, tuna fishing practices in the Indian Ocean. In that sustainability process also, we thought about, uh, someone said it, it's, you've got the sustainability of the resources which you thought of, which you're working on, you're genuinely looking into, but you've got your manufacturing practices. Are you ethical or not? Nice country to be on holidays, but there are laws. We've been under British colony, in the, under French colony, so the laws are like Europe, as stringent as they are. So there's a good story to tell in terms of ethical uh, practices also. So the manufacturing practices, I mean, for instance, the labor law or what the ILO dictates. We wouldn't go less than this. There is always a context, but there is, always, but there is the guideline. We go by what the ILO would say. So there's a good story, there's a thought process. We've invested in the logistics. We've groomed up people now to look into the R&D. What we're doing today is not enough. We really need to do more with less because we, we realize that today we land around 150,000 tons of tuna on the island, but that would probably go. I don't wish, but that would probably go down in the coming years. And that's how we should right from now, at this crossroad, decide how do we add value. So in that thought process also, we realized, for instance, from the boilers, the oil went into feed industry. Probably not a DHA demand market. You've got a high DHA, but using it for aquaculture. It's not being optimized. So the thought process went to, you have to partner, like it was rightly mentioned. You have to partner with people who would make an optimum use of it. It's not about, I mean, it's a thought process. It was a noble thought process, a uh, noble thought, but it's a business thought, you know? No one does business without making profits, without uh, getting a survival out of it. But in that thought process, we did have elements how to bring in a good puzzle, which brings a good story at the end of the day. So I think many of the ideas that came up uh, today is very, very true, and, uh, yeah, logistics-wise, it's a bit of a challenge. Uh, the, the, the thought of, uh, the idea of uh, shipping away, yeah, we're far away, but we're connected. Be it we go to South Africa, to Singapore, whatever. We're connected, we can move in a, the different, uh, we can move in the volumes. There is a challenge of small quantities, but that will evolve. A, as I said, is do more with less, but also do the right thing. We're doing two types of oil, like uh, Mark mentioned, indeed, uh, right? But there would always be an element of a crude, which, is, which has to go for refining, which has to go into a challenging refining process because the tuna oils have got certain contaminants. But the, on the oil side, let's say what was mentioned about mercury and all these things, it's a little bit of a challenge. It's less of a challenge than on the meal side. But one of the product would be the, the crude. You really have to go into refining, but there is another product 
which is next to, I'm not saying no refining, but very a short refining process. It's made up where the whole logistics is really food grade, really protected. You secure the norms, you come in, you minimize your oxidation from out of the coal storage facilities up to the oil is produced and stored. So there are really different products. And the oil as on date, it goes in infant formula. But like someone said, toddler, senior, these are things that are to be fought. But I don't think we have the potential, we have the capacity, we have today the networking to go into a new thing. So we have to partner with people again. Yes, indeed, tuna is a lot of evil talks about it, but rightly pointed out also there are different species. We don't have all the species in the Indian Ocean, but probably the major species that land for processing in the Indian Ocean is still a green flag. It's still a green uh, species. So it forms a majority whereby you're already complying to the sustainability of the resources. So in a way, there is a good story to tell based on the background which I just said. So how do we move from there? This is the challenge, is who do you partner with? How do you get, you make sure you secure the best share of what uh, you probably can get from to it? So to be very honest, there are different streams we can look at, but do you produce and then you wait and find people or do you start working into collaboration with people? So this is where we pick up, we, we, we take uh, note, we take uh, a account of the different uh, ideas that were suggested and would like to move into that. Pretty much of a challenge, if I go to the refining, we know that there's a level of contaminant uh, which is uh, not a, a direct processing, a direct refining. And uh, Audrey is very right to say, if you don't have the size, you don't have the economies of scale, then uh, probably not the business to be into. You'd be running, you'd be setting up a plant and run one out of five days, one out of seven days a week, which is not the right thing probably to do. So it's really a challenge to come closer to the, to the consumer, to the, the B2C, like rightly pointed out, but we, we, it's not an imperative. We don't want to be a B2C. For us, it's in that thought process, how do we, how do we get the tuna? How do you make sure we are compliant to the rules, regulation of fishing or processing the tuna and then get it to the right market? This is the prime objective of the whole thought process. And volumes we can see two times, three times in the near future. We are also working on the R&D into looking at uh, a refine into better processing, really optimizing, coming up with equipment. You know, you, there are manufacturers of equipment, but there are also the, 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 the experience of production so with your experience of production, you partner with manufacturing uh, equipment uh, suppliers. So you're able to, to add value into really optimizing. You know, if you read, there are 10, 12, 14% of oil content in, 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 in the fish. But who does really extract that? Dare to dream. This is what we want to take the process to. But I think now it's a bit of a challenge is you don't wait till you get the volumes and then you start marketing it. Like someone pointed out, it's, a, it's an oil which can oxidize very quickly. It's a bit of a challenge to maintain the quality. So you really now to start. You really now to find your partners now and buy a ticket like Europe, would like to go to Europe, would like to go anywhere else in the world. But uh, it's really who you can partner with. How do you get, not the beef, but how do you get the best of what you want to get from your products? Hey, is there anything else? If you could just go down, okay. what else I didn't cover. So the EPSA recommendation, so this came up. I think there will be a time, uh, this is not for tomorrow. It takes a time until the enforcement comes in. So probably not from our point of view, something which can really comment, but true. Uh, EU sets the tone, China follows, everybody else follows, and uh, that definitely brings in opportunities. So that's why we feel we oblige in that business that we should really uh, do what the best we can do. A contracting strategy, we did think about that is a single partner where all your oil, where you'd really put in all your efforts into your manufacturing, into your uh, supply chain, where you really get your, your custody certified, 
where you're really getting the best of what you're producing elements are. But then there's a business risk. There's always a business risk. If your partner, you don't hope, but if something goes wrong with your partner, so you end up a restarting again. We went through the process of validation. It took a couple of months, even if it's not a B2C process. It took a couple of months in the B2B to validate, to make sure that the, a, the oil goes through, that the product is right, that it's adding value, that the customer is satisfied. You need to buy a couple of times, the consistency of the quality. So these are things which we think that we've really a sort of cornered today. If we sell something, we can talk about the story, about the quality, we can talk about a, our reliability into it, and we don't want to be bidders, we want to be suppliers, we want to be there with our partners, things go wrong, we can adjust, we can amend, we can assist. So this is sort of the business model which we would like to go. But obviously there are ideas, so we need to think about what else we can do from here, but pretty much what you all said about the, the core elements of getting this business moving. So for us at the crossroad, the most important, as I said, is who do we partner with? So thanks, I've already noted two names, uh, whom I'm going to contact uh, uh, for meetings. But uh, that's, in a way, the big picture of where we are and where we are heading. So we take notes of everything that was said and uh, available for any question. Thank you.